There are many reasons to be pro-life, but the most important stems from our Christian faith. At Piedmont Women's Center, we believe that every human life is made in the image of God and should be protected from conception until natural death. You will now hear from local pastor Carl Robbins as he discusses the sanctity of human life. Piedmont Women's Center is an evangelical Christian ministry that's deeply committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ and also to the sanctity of life. And because we are committed to the sanctity of life, we want to talk about why we're committed to the sanctity of life. First of all, I should talk to you about my presuppositions, my biases. Everybody you will ever meet is horribly biased. I am, this ministry is as well. But we're just willing to name our biases. Our, our first bias is is that God is and has revealed himself. Genesis 1-1 doesn't begin with proofs for the existence of God. It begins with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so that's our first presupposition, is the existence of God. The second presupposition we hold is that God has revealed his character, He's revealed his gospel, and he's revealed his standard for ethics. In his character, in Exodus chapter 34, the Lord says and tells us that he is gracious, long-suffering. He lists several attributes. We can know God. He's told us what he's like. In terms of his way of salvation, he tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 what that way of salvation is. That salvation is only through the Jesus Christ who was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died a substitutionary atoning death, and rose again. And then his standard for ethics is revealed in the moral law, those, those 10 words that are given to us. And they are shown to be abiding and permanent because they're written in stone. Well, he's revealed all of these things in his written word. In fact, he's told us that his word is, is uh, living and we are to abide by every word in the scriptures. He's told us that all scripture is God breathed and is profitable. So I want to talk to you today about five reasons based on these presuppositions, five reasons why we believe that all human life is sacred. The first is we believe that every human life, both in the womb and out of the womb, has value because they are made in the image of God. We can't even get out of the first chapter of Genesis. Let me show you in Genesis chapter 1. We can't even get out of the first chapter of Genesis without seeing this stated four times. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, the Lord says, Let us make man in our image, that's the first time, According to our likeness, that's the second time. So God created man in his own image, that's the third time. In the image of God, he created him. Now, the reason why I stress that is in the very first page of the Bible. Here, man is, is portrayed as the immediate creation of God and in the image of God. And being an image bearer is what enables reciprocal communication between God and man. Because we are made to think God's thoughts after him. Uh, he can speak to us in his word. We can speak to him in prayer. And we can understand one another. Being in the image of God means that we're in the mental and moral likeness of God. All of us are defective and marred by sin, but we are still image bearers. The very first reason why Piedmont Women's Center exists, why we believe that life is precious, is because we can't get off the first page of the Bible without being told that every person is made in the image of God and therefore they have value and worth. The second reason why we believe every life has value, dignity, and worth is because of the personal involvement of God with each and every life. David writes in Psalm 139, you formed my inward parts. You, you covered me in my mother's womb. And he goes on in Psalm 139 and speaks about how the fingers of God were all over him when he was being knit together in the womb. And so we, we see that every life has worth and dignity because God has been there. He's been the one uh, knitting together that child in the womb. But even then, we recognize that God can so work on that child in the womb 
that they can even have spiritual experiences. A great example of this is in Luke chapter 1 when we have that glorious saga of Mary who's carrying the Lord Jesus Christ in her womb. She goes to see her cousin Elizabeth and Elizabeth is herself also pregnant supernaturally and she's carrying John the Baptist in the womb. And as these two pregnant women come into the room, you have one of the most beautiful sights in all the scripture. Here's the older woman, Elizabeth, John the Baptist in the womb. Here's Mary, who has the Lord Jesus Christ in the womb. And as they speak, the, it's told to us in Luke chapter 1, Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, says that her, her son, John, leaps in the womb for joy because his Savior has come near, also in the womb of Mary. And what we see, if we're, if we're wise and careful biblical interpreters, we hear the words of Elizabeth when she says, the child in my womb leaped for joy. This is why it's so vital to understand that every word of scripture weighs a ton. She's just said that child in the womb is having spiritual experiences. He's, he's demonstrating the fruit of the spirit which is joy. Here's a child, John the Baptist in the womb, who gets all excited because his Savior has come near, also in the womb of a woman. How does that happen? Only because God has already been at work giving John the Baptist the fruit of the Holy Spirit, converting him, giving him spiritual experience. God has been at work in that child in the womb. And so the reason why we say every life has worth and dignity, the second reason is because God has his fingers all over the child in the womb. The third reason why we believe that every life has value, worth, and dignity is because the Bible speaks of this supreme value that God places on human beings in or out of the womb. In Psalm 8, the psalmist is, is thinking about this issue. He's, he's meditating, ruminating on God placing value and dignity on each person. And the psalmist writes in Psalm 8, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you've created, what is man that you're mindful of him? But you have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. This is God's inspired account of the worth and value of man, crowned with glory and honor. Several years ago, my daughter and I were grocery shopping at a local grocery store. And this is a grocery chain that hires handicapped individuals to be their bag boys. And so as we walked into the grocery store, a young man helped us out with our groceries and helped my daughter out with a tiny little bag. And, and before we left, my daughter reached over and hugged him and spoke some encouraging words to him. And she was a teenager at the time, and that kind of surprised me that she would have that sort of compassion as a teenage girl. And I looked at her and I said, what was that all about? And I had just preached the Sunday night before Psalm 8, and I'd focused on how every person is crowned with glory and honor. I didn't know that my daughter was actually listening when I was preaching this sermon. So it's this young handicapped man who'd carried our bags out to the car, turned and walked off, and I asked my daughter about that. She said, Dad, he's crowned with glory and honor. And she got it. She understood that that's the Bible's teaching. This is why we believe every person has worth and dignity, because it says crowned with glory and honor. That is every person you'll ever meet. The person who picks up your garbage at the curb, the person who waits on you at the grocery store, the person who is, is uh, doing landscaping at your place of business. They're crowned with glory and honor and deserves to be treated as such. A fourth reason why we believe that every person has worth and value and dignity is because the moral law of God, the Ten Commandments, prohibits murder. Ours is a culture that loves death. Proverbs 8, speaking of cultures like ours, says, All who hate me love death. And on the, on the contrary, the Christian loves life. This is one of the stark dichotomies between the culture and the world, is the Christian loves life. The culture seems to hate it. 
The Christian longs to see physical life preserved. This is why Christians for the last several hundred years, not only do they plant churches and colleges, they start hospitals. And so in every major city, you'll see Baptist hospital, Methodist, Presbyterian, Catholic hospital. This is just a normal outgrowth of our worldview because we love life. We want to see physical life healed and preserved. We also want to see eternal life saved and transformed. And so when it comes to life in the womb, Scripture will not allow you to depersonalize children and instead view them as sort of a blob of tissue. So for example, let's be real technical for just a moment. In the Old Testament, the Bible uses the exact Hebrew word, yeled, for children in the womb and children out of the womb. They weigh the exact same thing. And when we come to the New Testament, the New Testament uses the exact same Greek word, brephos, for children in the womb, for example, John the Baptist, as for children out of the womb. God even says in Psalm 127 that children are a gift of the Lord. And so vacuum abortions, saline injection abortions, these are no way to treat a gracious gift from a sovereign God. Instead, the Christian loves the law of God. We say with David, oh, how I love thy law. It's my meditation all the day long. We love not only to to prevent murder, we love to promote life. That's the positive duty that's commanded. When God gives a command, not only are we to avoid disobedience we're, and murder and ending of life unlawfully, we're to promote the, the preservation of life. And that's what Piedmont Women's Center is all about. A fifth reason why we believe that every life has value and dignity in the womb, even even uh, infants, tiny infants in the womb, is because Jesus Christ forever dignified and sanctified the womb. In the New Testament, the, the incarnation of Christ is a profound testimony to Jesus' affirmation of the sanctity of prenatal life. I guess in theory, it might have been possible in the eternal plan of God for the Savior to come to earth as a grown man, but in the wisdom of God, Jesus Christ went through all the stages of human existence from conception, nine months in the womb, 33 years of life, death, and resurrection. The personal history of Jesus, therefore, does not begin with birth. It begins with supernatural conception. And because of that, because the Father placed the Son in the, in the womb of a woman, we recognize that Jesus Christ has forever sanctified and dignified the womb. Therefore, we, we must love even preborn life. Now, the new criteria, after listing those five reasons, the new criteria that our culture has aggressively taken on is not sanctity of life, but quality of life. Peter Singer, the Australian philosopher who teaches at Princeton now, actually teaches bioethics, has been pushing the replacement view of sanctity of life for the last 40 years and saying the new ethos, the new worldview that we must adopt instead of sanctity of life is quality of life. And so Peter Singer has written things like this. He says, we can no longer base our ethics on the idea that human beings are a special form of creation made in the image of God, singled out from all other animals and alone possessing an immortal soul. Singer continues, we should recognize that in many cases, the life of your dog or your pig could be far more significant than that of a defective infant because the pig or the dog might possess superior powers of rationality or compassion. Singer concludes, mere membership in the species Homo sapiens can no longer be viewed to be morally significant. Our fundamental premise at Piedmont Women's Center is that humans are not valuable because of what they can do. That's what Singer is pushing. People only have value and dignity if they can do something. Our view is not that people have value and worth and dignity because of what they can do, but because of who they are. They're image bearers, stamped and made in the image of the triune God. And by the way, the whole idea of quality of life versus sanctity of life is a little bit of a foggy smoke screen. When you ask 
three or four different people what they mean by quality of life, you'll get three or four different answers. Some will say, well, physical criteria. By that, we mean people can only have quality of life. Uh, they're only fully human. For example, Peter Singer says, people are only fully human and can only have quality of life till they've been out of the womb for at least three months. Then, and maybe only then, can they do that. Others say, no, the only people who can have quality of life are perfect people. People have no deformities. People have 46 matching chromosomes in each cell. People who are free from any disease. Others say, no, the only people who can have quality of life are people who have meet certain social criteria, such as ability to love, self-consciousness, the ability to communicate clearly. Others say, no, you're all wrong. The only people who can have quality of life are those who meet mental criteria. For example, one Ethicist says the only people who can have quality of life are people who have an IQ over 50. Well, the problem, obviously, when you talk to the quality of life folks, is one of shifting standards. Who's going to be the person who determines quality of life? Will it be the courts, educators, medical industry, insurance industry, parents? Our premise is no, the one who should be defining personhood is the creator of personhood. And he is the one who says, I have made every person in and out of the womb in my image, and I've crowned them with glory and honor. So what's to be done? Here's where Piedmont Women's Center picks up and begins to do our ministry. What is to be done? Here's where we take our stand on scripture alone. When all the world's wisdom fails and changes, we can only take our stance on the solid rock of biblical revelation. We are called to pull down every false idea that, that rears itself against the word of God, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10. Therefore, you are being called to engage in the task of apologetics, the defense of the faith. You must, for example, when you're speaking to an abortion-minded client, you must ask them, what is your basis for authority? Does it have divine authority? You must counter arguments. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've sat across a young woman, perhaps a couple who were abortion minded and they said, I don't wanna have this child because this child is unwanted. And a very simple answer is mind changing, life changing for them to say, you know, let's ask the question, who doesn't want your child? The Lord says he wants your child. Right now, there are about 5,000 people in the state of South Carolina who stated they would love to adopt your child. Really, what you're saying is only one person doesn't want that child. Well, the practical implications we have to talk about for just a moment of the sanctity of all human life. Everyone you encounter, no matter what color or age or social status or educational attainment, has worth and dignity. Part of what's going to make the mission and the ministry of Piedmont Women's Center successful is if we give feet to our confession. If we say every person out there that we will meet has worth and dignity and value, but then we don't treat them as such. Our ministry will have no credibility. So one of the things that I would urge you to do tonight is to think through uh, a lifestyle, a Christian lifestyle that says, because I believe in the sanctity and dignity of all human life, this means this will radically impact how I treat every person I meet, not just the abortion-minded client who walks in the door, but every single person in my home, in my neighborhood, in my school, in this ministry, even the obnoxious client, the person who's difficult to get along with at that, that store. God is calling us to a worldview and a practice that views everybody we meet as having worth and value and dignity. One Saturday morning, when I had gone to open up our Grove Road Center, we had um, a young man pulled up into the parking lot about the same time I did and opened the center and a volunteer came with me and this young man walked into the, the center and my Spanish is very bad and it's obvious his English was awfully bad, but what made the, the encounter so difficult was he was holding a young woman by the arm and he was squeezing her arm. And he brought her in, and this was on Grove Road, and he was obviously confused, and he began to look around, and I could see a sort of a look, a quizzical look, a puzzled look on his face. And of all, one of our volunteers showed up, and she quickly took the young woman back to one of our counseling rooms. And I was trying to communicate in my very worst Spanish that I have, which is almost non-existent, what we were doing. 
And within about three minutes, the young man realized, I'm not at the abortion clinic. I'm someplace else. And he was very distressed. And so he called the young woman's name, his, his girlfriend, and called her to come out. And she came out, a lot of tears on her face. And he grabbed her by the arm again and was squeezing. And I thought, I'd like to poke this guy in the nose. And grabbed her, went out, put her in the front seat of the car. And I watched the yellow Camaro squeal out of our driveway and make a quick turn into the abortion clinic. And I knew what was going on. Even that person, the Lord impressed upon me in that moment, Carl, you've got to walk the talk, that this is a person who, even though you don't like their actions in this moment, you're upset at their lawlessness, and even the course of action they're going to take in the next couple of hours, they have worth and dignity. That's the person who we're talking about, the person you find hardest to love. They have worth and dignity because they too have been crowned with glory and honor. They're an eternal soul. They're a person who we must treat with respect and value. That's what we mean by the worth and dignity of the individual.